ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد we begin by praising allah we praise him and we seek his help and we ask for his forgiveness and we seek refuge with allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions whomsoever allah guides there is none to misguide and whomsoever allah leaves to go astray there is none to guide and i testify that allah alone is worthy of worship and that muhammad is the servant of allah and his final messenger i'm going to be speaking about islam the misunderstood religion there is no doubt that islam is one of the most misunderstood religions in the world today sometimes this is to do with pure ignorance sometimes this is also to do with negative propaganda in the media sometimes perhaps it is that people don't want to know the truth about islam but my objective is over the next few series of programs to explain some of the things that are commonly misunderstood about islam and muslims and so i've chosen for the topics some common ideas and some common concepts that are often misunderstood about islam and muslims the first being allah the first topic i want to talk about is who is allah what is allah is allah the same god of the bible or is allah a different god then i want to talk about islam what does islam mean what is the religion of islam really all about the other topic i'm going to be discussing is the sharia what is the sharia the fourth topic i intend to discuss is the topic of jihad these topics cover some of the most commonly misunderstood aspects of the religion of islam so let's talk about allah is allah the same god of the bible is allah the same god of moses of abraham of jacob of jesus or was muhammad may god's peace and blessings be upon him calling people to worship a new god a different god first of all let's examine the actual name of god allah in arabic people who are experts in the arabic language have given various meanings and interpretations for the origins of the name allah but one of the best explanations and that has been given by the great scholar ibn taymiyyah he mentioned that allah is a composite of two words in arabic al which means the illah which is a deity and illah in arabic is anything which is worshiped anything in which people put their faith and their hope and they tr- and their trust and they worship it this is an illa a god or a deity in english so allah is a composite of two words in arabic al the definitive article the illa a deity al illa and from that to allah so therefore the word in arabic means the god the deity it is very clear from the quran that allah is the creator the sustainer the controller of the heavens and the earth and this was a fact that was acknowledged by the pagan arabs the pagan arabs in the time of prophet muhammad who used to worship 360 idols around the kaaba never actually had an idol or an image of allah in fact the quran itself alludes to this 
For example, in one passage, Allah says in the Quran, "Kul ma Rabbu al-Samawat al-Sabah wa Rabbu al-Arsh al-Azim sayaqululillah," which means, "Say, O Muhammad, to the pagans, to the idol worshippers, Allah in the Quran is telling the Prophet Muhammad to ask this question to the idol worshippers: Who is the Lord of the seven heavens? Kul." مَا رَبُّ السَّمَوَاتِ السَّبَعِ Who is the Lord of the seven heavens? وَرَبُّ الْعَرْشِ الْعَظِيمِ And who is the Lord of the glorious throne? سَيَقُلُوا لِلَّهِ They will say it is Allah. In other words, the pagan Arabs knew that Allah was the Lord of the seven heavens, that Allah was the Lord of the glorious throne. In other places in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks the Prophet Muhammad to require of the pagan idol worshippers similar questions. For example, who sends down the rain from the sky? Who causes the crops to grow? Who causes that which is living to die and brings that which is dead back to life? In all of those instances, it is said in the Quran, Lillah. They will say it is Allah. In other words, the pagan Arabs recognized that Allah was the Lord, the Rabb that he was the creator, the sustainer, that he caused the rain to fall, the crops to grow. He gave life and caused death. So this is a fact that the pagan Arabs knew and they recognized. Similarly, Jewish Arabs or Jews who were living in Arabia at the time and Christians until today who speak Arabic referred to God as Allah. If one is to open the Bible, which is written in Arabic, then you will find that the Bible in Arabic also refers to God as Allah. In fact, the very word Allah is very similar to the words used in Hebrew, which of course is the original Mosaic language, and Aramaic, which most scholars agree, was the language of Jesus, then we find that various words are used for God in Hebrew, including El, Elo, Allah, Elohim. All of these bear a striking similarity to the Arabic word for the Creator, Allah. The Aramaic word for God is almost exactly similar to the Arabic. The Aramaic term, and this is the language that was supposed to, or scholars believe that was used by Jesus, is Allah. Almost exactly the same as the Arabic term Allah. So, this is not surprising in fact, because both Hebrew and Aramaic are Semitic languages. And Hebrew and Aramaic and Arabic are in fact, very similar languages. So therefore, both in terms of the actual name of God, Allah, and of course, more importantly, the concept of God, the idea that Allah, the Creator, the God, is a transcendent being, that God is different and distinct from the creation. God is the one who has brought the universe into existence, who has created it, who sustains it, who knows all and hears all, and who guides all things within this universe to what is good for them and to what is best for them. This concept, therefore, of God, of Allah, of the Creator, is also the same concept that is shared by Judaism and by Christianity, and indeed many other religions also have, in different ways and in different respects, a similar basic fundamental concept of a supreme transcendent being who has brought all things into existence and sustains them and maintains them. The Qur'an sums up this belief in God with a very beautiful chapter of the Qur'an called Surat Al-Ikhlas. And Surat Al-Ikhlas goes like this, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Allahu samad lam yalid wa lam yulad 
وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدْ Which means, say, he is Allah, the one. The term Ahad in Arabic means one and alone. This negates any concept that someone or something shares in the divinity of God, shares with God's complete power and control over all things. So God is alone. Ahad means not only one but alone. And Allahu Samad, which means Allah is a Samad. A Samad means that Allah is the one upon whom all things depend. Everything depends upon Allah. Every atom of the universe, every creature, every object, animate and inanimate, depends completely and entirely upon Allah, while Allah depends upon nothing. Allah is in fact completely self-sufficient and free from all wants and free from all needs. This is all understood in the term As-Samad. The Qur'an sums up this belief in God with a very beautiful chapter of the Qur'an called Surat Al-Ikhlas. And Surat Al-Ikhlas goes like this, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ اللَّهُ السَّمَدْ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدْ Which means, say, he is Allah, the one. The term Ahad in Arabic means one and alone. This negates any concept that someone or something shares in the divinity of God, shares with God's complete power and control over all things. So God is alone. Ahad means not only one but alone. And Allahu Samad, which means Allah is a Samad. A Samad means that Allah is the one upon whom all things depend. Everything depends upon Allah. Every atom of the universe, every creature, every object, animate and inanimate, depends completely and entirely upon Allah, while Allah depends upon nothing. Allah is in fact completely self-sufficient and free from all wants and free from all needs. This is all understood in the term As-Samad. Lam Yalid, which means that God is not begotten. No one has given birth to God. God is not the son or the daughter or the child of anyone or anything. This is emphasizing and making clear that Allah is distinct and separate and different from the creation. Walam yulad. And also Allah is not the begetter. Allah is not the begetter, nor is he the begotten. Lam yulid. God is not the begetter. Walam yulad. And nor is he begotten. So this also teaches us that Allah is not in any real physical sense a father. Because God is not a creature to beget, to have intimate relations with, for example, a woman in order to beget a child. So the Qur'an makes it very clear that Allah is distinct and separate and unique from His creation. Lam yulid wa lam yulad. And finally this brief chapter of the Qur'an concludes, wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan had. And there is nothing that can be likened unto Allah. Whatever we can imagine, whatever image that we could put into our head, Allah is not like that. Allah is not like any created thing. Allah is not like the moon. Allah is not like the sun. God, Allah, is not like a human being or like an animal. Allah is not like an existing created thing, nor is Allah a combination of created things because some people may imagine that God is a combination of created things, maybe with the body of a human, the legs of an animal, the head of another animal. No, Allah is not like a created thing or a combination of created things. And since the only things that a human being can actually imagine, the only things that we can actually imagine are created things.
we can only ever imagine in our heads and envisage something either that exists in reality, for example, say, like a lion or uh, a rat or the sun or the moon. We can envisage these things that actually do exist. Or sometimes human beings can create images that are or ideas of creatures or things that don't actually exist, but they are in fact a combination of things that do already exist. But Allah is not a created thing. Allah does not look like any created thing. Allah is unique. In fact, to even imagine that Allah, to even imagine that the Creator, to even imagine that God is like a created thing is an insult to God. It is an insult to God. I'm sure no one, no one of us would like to be called a piece of dirt. No one of us would like to be called an insect, a cockroach, a rat. None of us would like to be referred to in these terms. So how about therefore, if we imagine or envisage that Allah, the Creator, who is unique, who is Al-Akbar, who is greater than anything we can imagine, that we refer to Allah in terms or in a manner that we describe Allah as being like a created thing. This is insulting to Allah. This is insulting to the Creator. In order to really try and understand how great Allah is, I want to finish by mentioning a saying of Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, said that the universe compared to the kursi, the kursi means literally in Arabic, it could mean a chair or a pedestal. I'm sure you must be familiar or you must have seen pictures or maybe even seen a throne. The king sits on a throne and the king puts his feet on a pedestal. This is what they call in Arabic a kursi. The Quran tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a kursi, a pedestal. And this kursi is compared to the universe. The universe, rather, compared to the kursi is like a ring. You know, imagine a ring. And you take this ring and you throw it in the desert. The universe is like this ring. And the kursi is like the desert. That is how vast just the kursi or the pedestal of Allah is compared to the universe. And by the way, scientists tell us that our universe is 10 billion light years across, 10 billion light years. That's a distance so vast we can hardly imagine. So for us, the universe is huge, but in reality, it is like a ring thrown in the desert compared to the kursi. And the kursi is like a ring thrown in the desert compared to the throne of God, the arsh or the throne of God. So that means our universe is like an infinitesimally small speck compared to the throne of God. How about then God himself? It is beyond imagining how great God is. And if we understand this fact, if we understand this truth, then we must also understand why it is insulting to Allah that we should refer to the great wise and powerful creator of the heavens and the earth as being like or compared to or similar to some created being. In fact, this is a crime that is so severe. It is a crime that is so terrible in the sight of Allah that if a person dies and meets Allah on the day of judgment, which is the day when Allah will gather all human beings together. After all the human beings have died, God will recreate us and God will question us about all that we have done in this life. If a person has died, imagining or believing or making some equals or partners or rivals with God or imagining or believing that Allah is like something in this universe, or imagining that something in this universe is equal with Allah, they have made such a grave insult to Allah. They have made such a grave insult to the creator of the heavens and the earth that he will never forgive that person. The Quran tells us that Allah could forgive any sin that he wishes on the day of judgment, but he will not forgive 
that we have ascribed partners and that we have ascribed rivals and equals to him. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad told us that on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring a person. And this person had enjoyed so many things in this world. And Allah will ask this person, if you had the world and everything in it twice over, imagine that, everything in the world, all the palaces, all the food, all the wealth, all the riches of this world, would you ransom it now to save yourself from the hellfire? And when the person hears that, they will say, yes, my Lord. And Allah will say to that person, I asked you for less than that. I only asked you that you should worship me and worship only me. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. Allah wants us to recognize his greatness. Allah wants us to recognize his oneness. And of course, in this respect, this is where Islam differs with some aspects of Judaism and some aspects of Christianity because we believe that the concept of God has become corrupted. The God is the one God. Allah is the one creator. But in some respects, that concept and that idea of God has been corrupted by other religions. And the purpose, therefore, of the Quran is to return human beings to that correct and that pure and that true understanding which is in fact deeply imbibed within our own consciousness, our own nature. We believe our very nature helps us to understand this fact. It's what we call in Arabic fitrah, the natural disposition. And that is why in times of trouble, in times of distress, when we really think everything is going to fail us, then that is the moment that we remember God and we call upon God completely, believing in only the Creator is going to help us and going to save us. So to conclude, the concept of God in Islam is a universal concept. The God of the Quran is essentially the same God as the God of Moses, the God of Abraham, the God of Jesus, the God in the Bible. And in fact, Allah is the same God that is universally recognized by human beings all over the world. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم